So today we will be continuing with the biomolecules. The next molecule that we are going to start with is lipids. Lipids you have already heard during your smaller classes, especially it is a type of nutrition. Generally when we talk about lipids, you already know in mind that these are the compounds which contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But the thing to remember is in lipids, oxygen is far less and carbon is far more. That's why you require more oxygen to digest it. Obviously, when you are requiring more oxygen, you will get more energy. So this is one of the reasons why lipids provide more energy when compared to carbohydrates. So when we talk about lipids, this term was first used by the scientist Bloom. Basically, it defined lipids as esters of alcohol and fatty acids. Lipids are nothing but esters of alcohol and fatty acids. So generally when we talk about alcohol and fatty acids, these can be glycerol, cholesterol and other higher Alcohols. Basically, glycerol is the most common alcohol when we talk about lipids. And then, in some rare cases, you might find cholesterol or higher alcohols. <coughs> Fatty acids, if they are of the same type, then it is known as simple lipids when all the fatty acids are of the same type. But if the fatty acids are different, it is known as Complex lipids, like for example, a molecule of glycerol We are using one molecule of glycerol and three molecules of fatty acid. When they combine, you will get phenylphenidate with the removal of water. So basically, the structure of phenylphenidate looks like this. This is what your structure of trichalmitate looks like. Since you are using the same fatty acid, it is known as simple alcohol. So, lipids are the esters of alcohol and fatty acids. Now, next, when we talk about fatty acids, fatty acids they can either be saturated or unsaturated. Saturated means they do not contain a double bond. In saturated fatty acids, double bond is absent. In unsaturated fatty acids, double bond is present. 
So depending on the number of global presents, if it is one, it is known as MUFA. MUFA stands for Mono Unsaturated Fatty Acids. If it contains more than one, it is known as PUFA. PUFA stands for Poly Unsaturated Fatty Acids. Example are Omega 3 Fatty Acid, Polic Acid, and Stearic Acid. So these are the acids which are combined with glycerol, cholesterol, or other higher alcohols forming lipids. So generally, <coughs> if we classify lipids, you can always classify them into simple complex or derived. When we talk about simple lipids, you already know oils, fats and white cells. Oils and fats you either use it for your daily uses. So when we talk about oils, these are liquid at room temperature. Fats, these are solid at room temperature and whites you already know. You can identify it in the candles or anything. In complex, I already told you that if the fatty acids are of different types, then it becomes complex fatty acids. In addition to that, if your fatty acids also contain carbohydrates, then that lipid is called glycolipid. Glyco stands for carbohydrates and lipids you already know. Similarly, <coughs> if it also contains a phosphate, it is known as phospholipids. In derived lipids, you get either by hydrolysis from complex or simple lipids. are generally that they are insoluble in water and soluble in certain agents like ether and benzene. In addition to that, if lipids is hydrolyzed with an alkali, then we can form soap in the process known as saponification. Or if we pass hydrogen in the presence of nickel, lipids can be converted to produce vegetable Oils. This is also known as hydrogenation. In addition to these properties, there is also one property which you have already observed and experienced, like the fold order of the fats. It's called rancid. How this happens is the lipids they start to undergo <coughs> decay or destruction. So generally, when you talk about rancidity, it can either be hydrolytic or oxidative. Hydrolytic rancidity, what happens is the fatty acids which are highly volatile, they get oxidized. In oxidative, it generally occurs at the double bonds producing a fold or hydrolytic rancidity is basically also dissociated with full smell of dairy. Products. So that's why your butter or cheese after sometimes starts to smell. It's because of rancid GT. Lipids is an important part of our diets, but rather than that, it is also an important part of the human cells because lipids are present in the formation of membranes. It is an integral part of membranes. So because of lipids, <coughs> you get cells with clear cut boundaries enabling them to allow certain substances to pass through it. Now next we will move into enzymes. I already gave you a small talk about enzymes because basically enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are also known as biocatalysts. Biocatalysts what it means is 
these are substances which help in <coughs> the biological reactions. So when we talk about enzymes, the first thing that comes to mind is classification. So classification can either be on the basis of the substrate that it acts on or the reaction that it does. So if it acts on lipids, the enzymes are known as lipase. If it acts on nucleic acids, it is known as nucleases. And if it acts on proteins, it is known as proteases. This classification of enzyme is on which substrate it acts. Next classification is on the type of reaction that it does. For example, if it helps in oxidation, the enzyme is known as oxidatives. If it helps in reduction, it is known as reductase. And if it helps in isomerization, it is known as isomerase. So this is the classification of enzymes depending on the reaction that they help or on the substance which they act on. Now, how enzymes act, I already told you what it does is it lowers the activation energy. So basically the mechanism for enzyme action was proposed by Fischer and Osh. They each produced two hypotheses. Fischer hypothesis was Locke and E hypothesis Oschens was induced fit hypo. So by lock and key what happens is not all keys can open all the locks. So similarly an enzyme also has an exact site to which a substrate acts upon forming an intermediate complex okay. substrate complex which is temporary it dissociates producing the enzyme and the product so for an enzyme to act on a substrate it has a particular site which can accommodate one single substrate only. So this is known as the log and key hypothesis. Now, when we talk about induced fit hypothesis, rather what we said is the enzymes they have a site and the substrate as a particular shape. Now, what happens is the configuration or the shape of the enzyme changes in order to accommodate the substrate. So basically, if this is the case, then the enzyme undergoes a conformational change to accommodate the substrate. So this is the English script hypothesis. So enzymes help the metabolic biological reactions. But in some cases, enzymes they are also not completely active because they are inhibited and their <coughs> inhibition can either be competitive or non competitive enzymes they also become inactive that means they become in 
competitive. In the machine of enzyme are of two types competitive and non-competitive. By competitive what it means is suppose this is an enzyme, it has a site for attachment of substrate. Rather than the substrate, another substance which is same in configuration to the substrate attaches to the enzyme forming an enzyme inhibitor complex. So as a result, the site is not available for the substrate to attach and hence you do not get your products. So this in which another substance is competing with the substrate for attachment to the enzyme is known as competitive inhibition. Now competitive inhibition can be overcome by increasing the concentration of the substrate. That means if more substrate are present, obviously they will occupy all the free attached sites of the enzyme and there will not be any other substance attaching to the site. Whereas in non-competitive what happens is an enzyme does not only have a site of attachment for the substrate, it also has sites for attachment of other ions. So now in this case what happens is heavy metal ions attach to this site as a result the enzyme capacity is reduced. Now in this case the substrate does not have to compete with the enzyme because its kinetic activity is reduced due to other heavy metal ions. But whereas in competitive the substrate was competing with the substance. So this is your inhibition that is competitive and non competitive. In order to form product A, you require several enzymes designated as E1, E2, E3 and E4. Now by feedback inhibition what it means is, in order to form E, that is the final product, you require the intermediate products that is D, C and B. So this is basically done by enzyme E1, that is E1 converts A into B. E2 converts B into C, E3 converts C into D, and E4 finally converts D into E. Now by feedback inhibition what it means is, one of the products in the sequence of reactions or the final product itself stops the reactions in the initially. So that means the product E is blocking the conversion of A to B. This is known as feedback inhibition. Why this is necessary is so that when A is being converted to B and if this reaction that from B to C or C to D or D to E is processing at a slow rate then what happens is B starts to accumulate. When B starts to accumulate this enzyme is becoming hyperactive and the substrate A is being rapidly Reduced. So in order to avoid all this, the final product E, what it does is, it stops the conversion of E to P. So it stops as a jet pack mechanism. So the final product E is blocking the conversion of E to P. So this is known as feedback inhibition. So when we talk about enzymes, enzymes are also not always free. That means they can also be inhibited either competitively, inhibitively, <coughs> non-competitively or by the products itself. 
Now, since we have already known that enzymes are biocatalysts, so when we compare with catalysts, the properties are same. But the differences is that catalysts they function even in changes of pH or temperature, but enzymes they do not function in changes of pH and temperature. Like for example, if the temperature is increased, the enzyme gets denatured. So this is the differences between enzymes and catalysts. So this is the end of the chapter and we will be continuing with next.